I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Hi. Today, I'm, I'm going to try to get back to um, <clears throat> what I hope to make be my main focus of my channel, which is the uh, history of the world, history of the universe, old versus new, that sorts of thing on the planet, um, evolution of life, and such. And um, so to that end, I want to talk about my favorite proof that the Earth is old. Now, this isn't, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that this is the best proof that the Earth is old or that this is the most conclusive proof or anything. This is just the one that I like the best. Um, it, you know, I, I, think it, I think it nails it pretty well, and I've never heard a good explanation for it, although I will talk about that at the end. Hopefully there'll be time, because there is an explanation for it. It's ridiculous, but it's there. And um, so this involves chalk. All right? Common blackboard chalk. Uh, you guys are everybody's familiar with it, and uh, I'm gonna just in a second here. I'll 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 throw up a few videos and narrate. I did learn how to split my videos, so I'll I'll do that. But I want to just a b brief introduction as to why me as an invertebrate zoologist feels qualified to talk about chalk. Um, it, in you know, it, okay. When I was I, I I I if you read my profile, I used to be a college professor um, at a college in Sitka, Sheldon Jackson College, before it unfortunately shut down um, but I was a college professor there and then I adjuncted a few courses at the University of Alaska and at both of those schools I taught oceanography now if you know oceanography is the is it I tried to focus my my teaching of oceanography on physical aspects as opposed to the biological aspects which I covered in marine biology so two different courses I didn't want too much overlap on those so I t anyway so but in oceanography Part of what you have to include um, some biology, especially when it deals with production processes, um, dealing specifically with phytoplankton and phytoplankton blooms and the currents, the conditions, um, the stratification things that lead to these plankton blooms. You have to really get into that a lot. You get into this whole this verdroop graphs, which are really fascinating stuff, and I'd love to talk do a video about that someday, but I'm not going to today. Um, but anyway, what? Uh, uh, I'm gonna actually. I'm you know. I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna just show a couple of pictures. So uh, please t take a look. I'll narrate these and I'll get back. Thanks. Okay, here are uh, some ex examples of the algae, the coccolithophore algae. Um, you can see um, by this looking at that scale that these are just a few microns. Okay, these are about anywhere five to ten microns in diameter. And furthermore, those individual plate components fall apart. Um, making even smaller particles when these things die and sink to the bottom. So keep that in mind. Okay, now what I'm showing you here, this is a um, a bloom off the coast of England. So this is still continuing. These blooms are, are being carefully watched um, as a response to, you know, the in, uh, sea surface temperature changes, these blooms. They, they've happened here in Alaska, and they've had some pretty devastating effects. And I'll, again, talk more about that. Now finally, this is the famous White Cliffs of Dover, okay? Uh, these are just immense, uh, over 100 meters in thickness, um, and probably in total exceeding 200 meters in thickness. Uh, they've been eroded away in some places and such. All right, I will uh, be back in just a second. Okay, so uh, that was hopefully that'll that'll provide a little bit of background for this. Um, I want to finish up as a quick summary. I want to make sure I have enough time to address the the YEC explanation for these. Um, so anyway, so the, to tie it all together, coccoliths. Okay, you saw the picture from space. They're white. They're opaque. Okay? Um, so this is what I call, I call them suicide blooms. Um, I don't know if that's an official, any kind of an official term or not, but I call it suicide blooms because what happens here, this is, this is what ties it together. When these things bloom, right, they bloom at the surface down for several meters, they cut off the light. They block out all available light to other photosynthetic organisms, including each other. Okay, so what happens is, is when these blooms spread, they don't last very long. They spread immense rapidly. Um, one day the water's clear, one day the water's white, and a few days later, it's clear again. These things, they they bloom and they kill off everything, including themselves. Okay, sometimes they'll bloom repeatedly during the summer, depending on the, the oceanographic conditions. Okay, so in studying these blooms, what we found is that because 
They simply cannot. In other words, okay, because of this light issue, right? No amount of additional nutrients, no amount of additional any anything needed for life will sustain this bloom, okay? So I want to make that I guess that's an important component of it. These blooms are unlike most most plankton blooms bloom until all the nutrients are gone and then they die, right? So yep, they bloom, and if you were to, if say you were to artificially just keep pumping nutrients into the water system, they would just keep on blooming forever. Okay, coccoliths, on the other hand, block out light. They block out this critical component, and they cause the entire system to crash. Okay, they 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 kill each other. They kill all the other photosynthetic organisms in the water at the time. Okay, so these are very short-lived blooms. So we've calculated what is given. Let's say let's let's optimize the conditions. Optimize best temperature, best salinity, best nutrients. How many of these coccolith blooms could happen per year? And how much accumulation happens per bloom? From that we get an estimate as to what is the maximum rate that coccoliths could accumulate on the ocean floor given perfect conditions, absolutely perfect laboratory conditions, what would be the maximum rate they could accumulate ever? Okay? What do we find? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a little over one millimeter per year. I'll say, let's just screw it. Let's say two millimeters a year. We'll say that, okay? It, that's that's in, ex, in excess, but that's it. Two millimeters per year, okay? And that actually works out to be, I think it's about 180 coccoliths thick. All right, that's the maximum amount that could accumulate on any seafloor given the best of all possible conditions. All right. How thick are the White Cliffs of Dover? We'll go with the conservative estimate. I'll say 100 meters thick. Okay, 100 meters. That is 100,000 millimeters. Right, 100,000 millimeters divided by two. We're talking about optimal conditions here. We have 50,000 years for the accumulation of the White Cliffs of Dover under the absolute best possible circumstances. It cannot change. They, they cannot be accumulate from other words. In other words, there can't just be lots of other blooms and they're all accumulating in Dover. Okay, that's not the way it works. These things are these these things of of white are very very pure. Um, you know, there's silt and things mixed in there as well, but for the most part, it's pure chalk. That's why it's good for writing on blackboards with. It's excellent chalk material. All coccolithophore, mostly coccolithophore skeletons. All right, so understanding those those factors, understanding the fact that they cannot accumulate any faster than that, what does Answers in Genesis say? Okay, Answers in Genesis, they talk about these. They say the White Cliffs of Dover, I'll just get this up real quick, I can refer to it. They say the White Cliffs of Dover are proof of the global flood. I think, hmm, how is that? So I look, I look down their page, and it talks about how they're formed, and how what what evolutionists believe, which is exactly what I told you, what we believe. Um, talks about how thick they are, all this kind of stuff, the biblical view. Well, they state that under the flood conditions, productivity was even higher than it is. Okay, under flood conditions, um, inc including they list these flood conditions that would help a coccolith bloom. They say turbulent waters, high winds, decaying fish increased temperature and nutrient from volcano volcanic waters okay first of all the turbulence makes it worse for the coccolis okay remember they are they already make the water turbid okay they get rid of they block out the sunlight so tur more turbidity isn't going to help them at all um he also says the mixing of fresh and salt waters coccolis are intolerant to fresh water they only like pure ocean strength seawater of uh, about 30 30 PSU, partial solidity units, okay? They can't stand any lower than that. It kills them. They like salt water, not mixed fresh water and salt water. So anyway, so this right here, and then the decaying fish, of course, you add nutrients. You could say, okay, those would add nutrients to the water. Same thing with increased temperature, makes it better conditions, and nutrients from volcanic waters, sure. But they still can't overcome the light problem. They're photosynthetic. So that whole AIG explanation completely and totally falls apart, makes no biological sense whatsoever. All right, thanks.